Next Sunday, we'll plan on our communion service and notice the date for the work day instead of the first Saturday, it'll be the second Saturday this month. Uh, we want to continue to pray for our missionaries and our political leaders. Notice those that are listed there. And we'll be covering a lot of scripture today, so uh, I've listed all of the verses that are used uh, in the bulletin, so I would encourage you to uh, pick up a bulletin so that you can follow along and uh, mark those verses that you want to check afterwards. But in Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 22, we read, An angry man stirreth up strife. Uh, and a furious man abounded in transgressions. An angry man is one who is filled with anger continually. He's quick to lash out against those who oppose his views. He harbors anger in his heart. And in some ways, he even likes to have folks oppose him because he likes the fight. He loves to argue. He loves to lord it over others any way he can. He'll use his temper to accomplish it. But God says a man of this source will stir up of this sort will stir up strife. And the Lord clearly says in Philippians 2, let nothing be done through strife, as far as in the church between believers. But the anger man prefers to generate strife from his own ideas. When strife comes up at work, in the church, politics, <laughs> at home, we recognize that the stirring of strife comes from the anger that is all just below the surface of the anger man. Usually there's someone that is bent to anger that is generating. But he says, a furious man abounded in transgression, continuing the thought. In fact, God, we recognize that God calls this fury, this anger, sin. Uh, the anger man may excuse himself that he cannot help it, but God calls it a transgression, which means lawlessness without law. God will never require us something that we cannot do in Him. He will enable us to see anger for what it is and give us grace to overcome it. But if one gives themselves to anger, they will abound in transgression. It just doesn't fit the Christian life. The solution for anger is similar to the solution for bitterness. Do not fail of the grace of God. It is power that is available to every child of God to resolve it. When, he, when a believer feels anger welling up inside, it's, it's important that he calls out to the Lord for grace that he needs to overcome it, to trust him for what you need, and thus you can live free of the blight of anger. For those who are not given to anger, we need to seek wisdom from God to recognize the danger of angry men and to steer clear except in, in ways we can minister to them, their anger could lead to transgressions against you. They're not interested in God's ways, but in their own. They only want to use their anger to control others. So let us be wary of the angry man, the furious man. Let us trust the Lord to give us wisdom uh, whenever we come across it. Let's bow together in prayer. Dear Father, we thank you and praise you for the magnitude of your goodness. We rejoice at how you work in each of our lives, teaching us to trust you. We don't need to depend upon anger. We rejoice in the fact that we can depend upon you and trust you to accomplish your purposes in each of our lives. Now, dear Lord, we ask you to bless the study of your word. Help us to see the issue before us in light of your word, in light of your spirit, in light of who you are. I'm trusting you to enable us to be clear. I'm trusting you to prepare our hearts to receive the teaching that you have for us. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. All right, the children are dismissed for Children's Church. And as they leave, would you turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. While a system of theology can help us to understand the whole of Scripture, the problem is that once one determines a system to be believed, they can, if they're not careful, uh, interpret verses of the Bible in light of that system instead of letting the Word of God shed light on whatever problem may be in that system. In other words, let these glasses represent a system of theology 
far too often those that, that profess a system that depend upon it, they, they look through their theology to interpret the Bible instead of looking through the Bible to interpret their theology. And so it's important to understand that any system lends itself to that. Um, now, such is the system of theology that is known as Calvinism. Um, while most Calvinists honestly believe the Bible teaches their system, there are a number of verses that are misunderstood, even distorted, in light of the whole of the Bible. If a new believer was to pick up a Bible for the first time, they would not see Calvinistic theology anywhere in the Bible. They may, there may be questions that come to their mind, and the one who answers those questions is the one that influences them or teaches them towards that direction. While many Calvinists are dear brothers in the Lord, their theological system only serves to misrepresent the God of the Bible, making him out to be something he is not. I do not speak against men who love the Lord but have accepted the teachings of Calvinism. I'm not claiming that I, I can answer everything uh, to such an extent that it settles the, the argument or the debate. This debate has been raging for centuries. So I'm not the solution I don't claim to be. But I speak against the system of theology that appears to me to be inconsistent with who God is. I don't claim to be smarter than all the Calvinists who are out there, but I simply relate to you how I understand the issue in light of what God says in the Word of God about Himself. In fact, when I started out in the ministry, I was literally afraid of the tenets of Calvinism. But I came to the conclusion that if it's of God, then I need to embrace it. If it is the truth, I should not be afraid of truth. And so I was willing, I opened my heart, I studied it with the understanding that if it's true, I want to believe that. But the more I studied, the, the greater the questions became, and Calvinism could not answer them. Now, the question that, that baffled me throughout the whole time I was studying was, how could God offer salvation to whosoever will but not allow those to be saved who are not of the elect. That just didn't, didn't compute. I didn't understand it. That's like the school <coughs> cook saying to all the students in the cafeteria, everyone who wants to come up for a second helping of strawberry a shortcake, line up. And then go through the line and say, you, you, and you can have a shortcake. The rest of you sit down and watch a meeting. Um, the point is, this, this is not the God of the Bible that we see whenever he says, for example, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, in Matthew 11. Now, I don't know everything about English. In fact, some may say I don't know much about English. But the fact is, it appears to me that the word all means all. He said, Come unto me, all ye that labor. And who doesn't? Now, when he said, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life, in John 6, 47, I cannot see a limitation to apply belief only to what they call the elect. He that believeth speaks of the choice we have to make. How many people of the world, let's, let's look at numbers here for a moment. How many people of the world would you say are genuinely born-again believers? When we look at all of the different religions that teach otherwise and all the folks that are nothing, we have to recognize anywhere from 2 to 5%. Let's go with a high number, 5%. That means that God would invite 95% of the world to believe on Him with this invitation, but actually mean that they could not believe on Him because they were not of the elect. That's what Calvinism teaches. Anyway, I read what they had to say, and all I can conclude is they use their theology as the lens to look at the Bible. They do not allow the Bible to be the lens through which they look at their theology. First of all, the man who started this whole thing was Augustine, a theologian back in the, uh, many moons ago. And one of his followers but was a man that popularized it by the name of John Calvin. He became the governor of the city of Geneva, Switzerland. 
he decided he would make his city a Christian city. He had noble intentions to begin with, but he required all to follow whatever he taught, period. No one could think for themselves. He became a cruel despot who executed on whims. One man in particular, Cervantes, was, was a man that thought he was a friend um, of Calvin, and he decided he would come visit him. Now Cervantes had written a book that was critical of some of the things that, that Calvin had taught. So when he arrived at the city, Calvin arrested him, and he decided he would execute him by burning him alive at the stake. He strapped the book that he wrote, Cervantes wrote, onto his chest, and he commanded that that book be lit first so that it would melt his face first. And it was said of him that he, he grinned with great delight whenever he screamed in agony. Calvin was responsible for burning at the stake 34 women for supposedly being witches. How does, one, how does someone prove witchcraft? The fact is that, that, that they were someone that either disagreed with them or their husbands disagreed with them, and that's how he would get at them. He was a vicious man. In no way could we say that he demonstrated Christian character. This is the man for which this theology is named, Calvinism. Now, to summarize what he teaches, it's impossible to summarize adequately, but I'll just give up, because there's a wide range of understanding of Calvin's teachings. It's generally summarized into five points with the acrostic of the word to him each letter standing for one of their teachings. Calvinism de de defines the T with total depravity, and they recognize it as being man is so set on sin that he is totally depraved and unable to save himself. Now that much is correct. But then they go on to say the only way anyone can believe is if God chooses them and then regenerates them before he draws them to salvation. To them, total depravity is a total inability to believe on Jesus Christ. The you is unconditional election where God unconditionally chooses out of the good purposes of his will to save a minority of mankind, 5% or less. Deliberately passing over the vast majority of men and women to forever glorify God in their condemnation. But they are condemned because they would not believe, but they would not believe because God did not choose them to be saved. And thus the circular reasoning of Calvinism. The owl is limited atonement where Christ died on the cross, they say, only for the elect. He did not die for a single one of those that were not elect. The eye is irresistible grace where they say that the elect, the ones that God has chosen, have no power to resist the grace of God for their salvation in spite of the stories of men that had. The P is the perseverance of the saints. All the elect will eventually persevere and be forever saved in glory. Now, personally, many of the points, I agree with the, the idea behind the points, but the way they define them brings me to the conclusion I cannot accept any of the points the way they define them. One cannot exclude any one of these points. There are some that say they're three-point Calvinists or four-point Calvinists, but in doing that, they have confused the whole doctrine because it all intertwines together to believe any of it is to accept all of it. Uh, or a person cannot be in any way consistent with the system. Um, First of all, let's look at what, he's, what Calvin tells us about total inability to respond to the gospel. Uh, I believe in total depravity. I believe that men in their lost condition are indeed totally depraved, are completely given to sin. Now, not all are given to the same degree of sin. We recognize there are noble sinners. But as far in the eyes of God, the Lord says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. In Romans 3.10, there is none righteous, no, not one. The Bible is clear that all have sinned, that there are none who are righteous in and of themselves, no matter how noble they try to be. Calvinism teaches that no one is good enough to believe. 
how does it require goodness to want to escape the condemnation of hell? The decision to believe is actually more or less self-focused is to keep oneself from hell. How is there goodness in saying, I don't want to go there. I choose to trust in Jesus as Savior. That's not goodness. That makes sense. <laughs> Calvinism teaches that the sinfulness of man is such that we are unable to respond to the gospel unless he chooses us, then regenerates us, then he saves us, making it a process instead of all at the same time. I do not believe at all that the Bible teaches that we're unable to receive the claims of Christ. Calvinism says that we're dead in trespasses and sins, so uh, they use as an illustration a corpse. You can't save a corpse because a corpse is dead. They cannot respond. But God is not calling our bodies to respond to the gospel. The whole issue of salvation is dealing with the spirit, not the body. The lost have a spirit that is dead in trespasses and sins. Death means separation. When a person dies, the body is left here. Their spirit is present with the Lord if they're saved and goes on to condemnation if not. Um, a spiritual death is separation from God because of the sin in their life. Because when a person trusts Jesus as Savior, then their sin is removed from condemnation. They cannot live a perfect life, but they, in their standing before the Lord, they, uh, they are made righteous. And then eternal uh, death is speaking of eternally being separated from God. God issues the judge, is just judgment upon them, and He says, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. So eternal death is being separated from God forever. Now, all the invitations in Scripture, if Calvinism was true, then all of the invitations in Scripture mean nothing. Isaiah 1.18, God is speaking to rebellious Israel. And He is dealing with them as individuals as He says, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool calling lost individuals to reason with the Lord. Their sins can be washed away if they would choose to come to Him to reason with them. Why would God call them to Himself if they could not, as Calvinism teaches? If Calvinism were true, then the lost cannot respond to the Gospel. Now what is it that they're saying? That they are saying that the gospel has no power to save if they're not of the elect, if they're not chosen. But the Lord said in Romans 1.16, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Calvinism says that God has to choose them before the gospel has any power. Yes, all, all of us are sinners. None of us can save ourselves by our own works. The Lord clearly says in Ephesians 2, For by grace you save through faith, and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It is, a, it is a gift because our works are not good enough. It is a gift because if we try to work for it, then it insults God. Titus 3, 5 says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us. We bring nothing to the table to earn salvation. He offers it as a gift to be received. We cannot work for it. To try to work for it is to insult God and saying that His gift is not enough. John 1.12 says, But as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. As many as received, He did not say, as many as are chosen that receive Him, but he says to as many as received him, it's our decision whether or not we choose to receive him. Perhaps the foundational of truth or, or the foundational idea, it's not truth, but the foundational idea of Tulip is unconditional election. I believe in election, that's a Bible term. I believe in predestination, that is a Bible term. But I do not believe that it's unconditional. It is conditional on whether or not we believe. 
In 1 Peter 1.2, he says we are elect according to the foreknowledge of God. The foreknowledge of God is not the same as foreordination of God, such as how Calvinists explain this verse. Romans 8.29 says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate or foreordain to be conformed to the image of his Son. Both words are used with different meanings. You have foreknow and predestinate. Foreknow is a reference to his omniscience, the fact that he's all-knowing. Foreknowledge speaks to the fact that he knows what we will do. Foreordain speaks to the fact that he knows what he will do. He chooses us according to what he foreknows. Look again. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God. He does know who will be saved from the foundation of the world. And he chooses those he knows will choose him. It's like a, a group of uh, kids get together to choose a team for a game of softball. They're not going to, the captains are not going to choose those that are going to be arrogant or refuse to get along with him. Uh, you're going to have someone who gets along with him. Same with the professional teams. They don't want to, they don't want someone that's going to uh, kick at everything that the, that the coach tells them. God knows whosoever will, and thus he chooses. If foreknowledge were to equal foreordaining, there's a major problem here. Because that God foreknows those who will sin, and that is to say that God would foreordain that they sin, that it's His will for them to sin. And that's not what God says about Himself. The Calvinists who, who carry it to this point say that it was God's will for Adam to sin, to partake of the fruit. It was God's will for Pharaoh to refuse to let the people go. It was God's will for David to sin against Bathsheba and Uriah. But James 1.13 says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. That's something we can do that he cannot. God cannot be tempted with evil. We can. Um, because that's contrary to his character. All sin is by our own choice. But to say that all is from God is to blame Him for evil. Now in Ephesians 1, Calvinists often use this passage to misrepresent God. Look in verse 3 where he says, Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The context of these, what, of these ten verses is spiritual blessings, things that accompany salvation. He is not here talking about salvation. Now look in verse 4. According as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. What has He chosen us to do or to be? He has chosen us to be holy. He has chosen us to be without blame. He's chosen us to love as He loves. In other words, He has chosen us to become conformed to the image of Christ. That's the blessing. That's the things that accompany salvation. In verse 5, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself according to the good pleasure of His will. Calvinists jump on this and assume that He's talking about salvation, but He says He is talking about the adoption of children. That when we make the decision to trust Him as Savior, we are adopted into His family. That is what we are predestined to do, predestined to happen to us when we make the decision to trust Him. Verse 11, we see something similar. He says, In whom also we have attained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of Him who work with all things after the counsel of His own will, that we should be to the praise of His glory who first trusted in Christ. So we are predestinated unto being unto the praise of His glory. None of these verses are talking about salvation, but they're talking about blessings that accompany salvation. In Romans 8.29, He says, For whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate. But to what? To be predestinated. It was His will before the foundation of the world that all who are saved would be conformed to the image of His Son. 
to foreknow is different from predestinate, as we mentioned earlier, but to be predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That is his purpose for every child of God. Those who do uh, uh, allow him to squeeze them into his mold will be an influence to win others to Christ. Because he goes on to say that they may be the firstborn among many brethren. Those who conform to his image will be glorified. In other words, they will be rewarded. Those who do not allow God to conform them to his, his uh, image will not receive that glory, will not receive those rewards. Well, they will still be in heaven, but empty-handed and with no crowns on their head. The Bible does teach uh, election and predestination, but election to salvation is according to his foreknowledge. Predestination has more to do with blessings and service. Now, in Calvinism, they claim that we are unconditionally chosen to salvation. God chooses us for no apparent reason, just according to His good purpose. Those He chooses will be His elect and will be saved. Those He passes over are the unelect and cannot be saved. God does have a limitation on who will be saved, but it's not by His choosing. God says that only those will be saved who choose to believe on Him. And He says it over and over and over again throughout His work. Um, and that's what you call a condition. In John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Notice, God so loved the world, not just the elect. That whosoever believeth in Him, whosoever, whosoever believeth in Him. Calvinism changes that meaning. And they say, whosoever of the elect believes on Him, then they should not perish. John 3.18, He that believeth not is condemned already, already because he hath not believed. Not because he was not chosen, but because he did not believe. He is not condemned because of what God arbitrarily chose before the foundation of the world. He was condemned because he made a decision to not believe on Christ. Salvation is indeed of the Lord, but we have to decide whether or not to believe. John 3.36, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. Not he that is of the elect that believes on the Son, but he that believes. That is our choice. He that believeth not the Son is our choice. And he says, They shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Calvinism makes the, all of these and all, so many more invitations in Scripture a farce. They're meaningless. Calling all to be saved, but the unelect cannot respond? Why extend it to them if they cannot? Revelation 22, 17, God closes the whole Bible with this invitation when He inspired John to write, and the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. Let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. And yet Calvinism says that this applies only to the elect. That's not what he said. Consider this doctrine from the perspective of the unelect. They are condemned because they would not believe. But they could not believe because they were not chosen. That's not the God of the Bible. Calvinism is, is claiming that the gospel has no power to save those of the unelect. When Scripture says the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. God's grace, there, according to Calvinism, they are saying that God's grace is not sufficient for the unelect. It applies only to the elect, so it limits it. The Calvinism says that the word of God cannot birth the unelect into this family. Though the Lord says in 1 Peter 1, born again by the incorruptible seed of the Word of God. The fact is that God's will is to save all men. But not all men will meet His condition for that salvation. In 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is long-suffering to us, Lord, not willing that any should perish. He did not say not any of the elect. 
He said he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And again, all means all. God's desire for every man, every woman in the whole world is that they would come to Him in repentance. 1 Timothy 2.4 who, God who will have all men to be saved. 1 Timothy 4.10 We trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. And thus we recognize His design of salvation is that it is sufficient for all. Brethren, Calvinism's distorted view of the sovereignty of God is a foundational idea that brings them to these conclusions. They look at the sovereignty of God and require Him to be so absolute in that sovereignty that He is the cause of all things, evil as well as good. That is, this is basic to their whole system of, of theology. Now, I believe in the sovereignty of God, but not as defined by Calvinism. Their exaggerated emphasis on the sovereignty of God actually eliminates the free will of man. Most Calvinists will say, well, that's just impossible to reconcile. You just believe both because the Bible teaches both. And that statement is true except for the fact that they have defined sovereignty of God in a distorted way. Calvinism, Calvinism's definition makes all invitations a hoax God is sovereign and man is responsible to choose. And that's fine for their definition of the elect, but the unelect cannot choose to believe, so therefore they are responsible. All the unelect can do is to choose to go downward, away from God. Calvin in his institutes wrote this. He said that we hold that God is the disposer and ruler of all things that from the remotest eternity, according to his own wisdom, he decreed that by his providence or sovereignty, the counsels and wills of men are so governed as to move exactly in the course which he has destined. So consequently, Calvin says that the will of man is governed by his will, not ours. He says God is the cause, the author of every thought, word, and deed. Every thought, word, and deed. So evil thoughts, evil words, and evil deeds are caused by God in the mind of Calvin. Adam's sin was caused by God. Judas Iscariot's betrayal was caused by God. It was God's will for those things to happen. That is preposterous. James 1.13, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth thee any man. God's sovereignty does not require that man has no power to make a genuine choice, moral or spiritual. Sin is man's choice. Righteousness is God's choice. He appeals to man when he says in Romans 6.13, Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and remember as instruments of righteousness unto God. Why make an appeal to righteousness if it's not us making the decision to be righteous or not? Why encourage to not choose unrighteousness if it's not our decision? This is an absurd definition of the sovereignty of God. God's sovereign power is greater than that in that He allows men to choose and He still accomplishes His purpose. We can choose stupidity and He still works good in us. It's like two horsemen that are holding their, their mounts in, in control. One is standing there, the horse doesn't move at all. Doesn't swish its tail, doesn't shake its head. And it stays perfectly still. The other is he is doing both, swishing his tail, shaking his head, blowing out his nostrils, stomping his feet. That, that horse is, um, there's a man astride that horse who is an expert horseman as he holds it in place. The child on the other horse is a stick horse and has no will of his own. Um, that really is an example of the two types of sovereignty that is defined. Calvinism defines the sovereignty of God that everything that happens 
is God's doing. Well, the Bible teaches that the sovereignty of God is such that He will work good regardless of the evil He faces. In Psalm 76, 10, He says, Surely the wrath of man shall praise thee, the remainder of wrath shall thou restrain. He allows the wrath of man to explode. It's not his will for that wrath to be there, as we saw in the proper. It's transgression. But he is so powerful that he can confuse man's purpose and still bring praise to himself in spite of man's purpose. And he goes on to say, if it will not praise him, he will stop man's wrath. God is a sovereign God, but he lets a man decide whether or not he's going to rule by his wrath or by the righteousness of God. Psalm 75, 7, God is the judge who put it down one and set it up another. God rules over nations to accomplish his purpose. He allows men to rule by their choices, by the votes of men, but to accomplish judgment or good upon the nation. He allows men to vote as they choose, and his purpose will still stand, will still be accomplished. There's so many dangers in this line of thinking called Calvinism. One is in pride in being chosen, that we're special. We are better than those that are not chosen. And so there is a lack of humble teaching, teachableness. Calvinism causes uh, genuine believers, especially when they're first saved, to wonder, well, how can I know I'm really chosen? There's no authoritative answer to the, the fact that I'm chosen, and they doubt God's promise because of that question mark. Far too many Calvinists, not all, but far too many Calvinists uh, allow their doctrine to kill their evangelistic zeal. Why evangelize if they're already chosen to be saved? Why bother sending missionaries if they're chosen they're going to be saved anyway? But the basic problem of Calvinism is how it misrep misrepresents God for who He is, especially to the unelect. The teachings of Calvinism those that hear it who do not know the Lord, oftentimes they will be harder to reject God because God is not a reasonable God in that line of thinking. God says, come and let us reason together. Calvinism makes no allowance for men to reason with God. The limitations of God are strong in Calvinism, and they would never admit it, but in reality it does. Because Calvinism limits the power of the gospel to the unelect. The gospel has no power of saving because they're not chosen. Uh, Calvinism limits his love only to the elect. Only the wrath of God abides on the unelect. Calvinism limits his grace that he only bestows his gifts that are undeserved to the elect. Calvinism limits his mercy to uh, only the elect. It, and the strange thing about it, though they tout the sovereignty of God, they in effect limit the sovereignty of God. They're saying that everything is God's will or it won't happen. Instead of recognizing His power to take our choices wrong as well as right and still accomplish His purpose. The scripture is clear that there is no limit to any of these things. We can rejoice that His invitation is to all men and to all women. Every person who ends up in hell is there by His own choice and that they would not obey the light that was given to them. John 1 makes it very clear that Jesus is the light of the whole world and He is the light of every man. So He gives light to every man. If you obey the light that He has, He'll give you more light. In other words, Calvinism misrepresents <coughs> the God of the Bible. If it were true, why is it that there were far more children who become an elect if they're raised in a Christian home with godly parents as opposed to those that are raised in homes where the parents blaspheme God? Why are there so many more elect in nations where there are more gospel preaching churches than in those that do not? There are many good men who have been deceived into believing and preaching this doctrine but they did not get it from the Bible. They were taught this doctrine and were, were shown verses, interpreted in light of this doctrine, and so they are deceived into believing. 
It does misrepresent who God is. Salvation is of the Lord. Indeed, we can do nothing to save ourselves, but His salvation is available to whosoever will. Whoever will choose to believe on Him will have the gift of eternal life. Let us purpose to do all in our power to encourage men and women to believe on Jesus for their salvation with the full confidence that the gospel is for them as well as for everyone else in the whole world. I recognize this is not a complete study. That could take volumes. I recognize that this is not. All I'm trying to do is explain my conclusions in regards to this. And I trust the Lord to use it in your heart that it would be a blessing. And we can recognize God is a God of all men and women that He's created. He loves every one of us. He would save everyone who would call upon Him, but He leaves the choice to us. I thank the Lord and praise Him for being who He is. And I rejoice in the absolute confidence that we can have that every person we meet has either heard the gospel and trusted the Lord or needs the gospel, we can be absolutely confident in that we're in His will to preach it with every opportunity we have. If you have not yet trusted Christ as Savior, you don't have to worry about whether or not you're going to be If you've heard the gospel, that is the power to bring you to Christ. Would you trust Him this morning? Let us be faithful to hold forth the truth as to who God is to a watching critical world. Let's bow together.